trying to catch the biggest fish that you've ever caught in your life. It's a challenge, to say the least. To try and explain to someone why you go fishing, that's even harder, I think. You have to, fishing is one of them things that you have to experience to get the message across as to why you do it. Um, I started out when I was a kid, I was about six or seven years old, I guess. Um, I grew up on a narrow boat on the canal, so I spent most of my evenings just fishing for perch over the side of the boat. And that's where it all started and it stuck with me ever since then. And I think that's kind of how we all get started. We all have that experience of being a kid fishing with somebody or our friends or whatever. The actual decision to start filming my trips comes simply because I haven't got any photographs of any of the fish that I've caught in my past. Um, taking a camera with me was just never part of my tackle box. In the old days when I was a young lad, it was like we didn't have phones and we didn't have social media and stuff like that. And it's something you never hear anymore. I wish I had a camera on me. I mean, in the old days when you had to have film in a camera and take it to a place to get it developed, hopefully they'd have it done in an hour. And then when you pick them up, it's got a quality control sticker slapped on the front of it. It was just never a vital part of my fishing equipment. So I never bothered. But now, obviously in the day and age where we are now, where we've got phones that we can just take a picture and look at it instantly, you can do it with remote, you can do it off your phone, you can do this, you can do that, and of course the opportunity to be able to share it with so many other people. It's just something that I wanted to get into. Believe it or not, even though I haven't took pictures of my fish in the past, I'm really into photography and it's something that I've been into for quite a long time now. And what better way to spend your time than to bring them two things together by taking your cameras and, and what you love about photography, you know, bringing fishing into it as well. And of course, you know, my old memories of being a kid, some of my most fond memories of being a kid was on a Sunday night when my mum used to let me stay up late and watch Go Fishing with John Wilson. And we haven't got that sort of thing anymore, you know. We might have things like river monsters and that, but that's not real life to us, you know. John Wilson used to go and fish rivers that we fished, fish lakes that we fished, catch fish that we're all familiar with. And that doesn't really happen much in this day and age. We have got it, but there's always this hidden message of buy our stuff. Whereas I wanted to bring that old school element back of just going fishing. For one guy to do that is a huge challenge. And I don't just do it on my own. There's people that do help with camera work and whatever. But to do that with me and perhaps one other person, if I'm lucky, was a challenge in itself, and it's something that I wanted to, to take on. Stupid, maybe, but, you know, if you don't try these things, then you're never going to know if you can do it or not. Fishing is 95% boredom and 5% pure adrenaline. It's like, how do you film something of a guy sitting by a lake and make people want it to be interesting. And to do that, I had to have a goal. And the, the best goal that you could ever have was to try and catch the biggest fish that you've ever caught. I needed to have a venue. And there has always been one lake that I've always dreamt about. It's, and it's ridiculous because it's not the kind of lake that you would imagine that an angler would dream about. It's pretty featureless. It, it, was, it wasn't a mature, you know, overgrown, hidden little pond with lily pads on the top and, and the big old chunks, you know, in a tight little corner. It's just it was quite a featureless, flat piece of lake that every swim was looked identical. It's um, located in the middle of a public park, so you always had people walking around and dog walkers and all the things that can interrupt you having a nice peaceful day's fishing. But it was the first place that I ever saw a carp just swimming about and chilling out. And when I, obviously when I grew up on the boat and I was catching perch and that, you'd see the odd fish moving around and that, but you never saw anything that got you excited. And I remember the first time of actually fishing there, thinking all I have to do is put a bait in front of these fish and that's it. And that just wasn't the case at all. And it took 
a few months for me to catch my first year fish um, out of that place. And that happened because I was in the right place at the right time and I didn't even have fishing gear with me. I was walking my dog around the lake and I see this old guy, he had a float rod, he's got his arm literally right up in the air like that and he's got his landing net down like that and he's struggling to try and get this fishing. He's got the float in the top eye of his rod. He's full stretch like that, some weird yoga position. And um, I was like, oh, do you want me to help you land this fish? I helped land this fish. I sat there talking to him and it turned out he was the bailiff of the place and he was so, I was saying to him, I'd never catch anything out of here. He said, all you need is a float and some maggots, mate. That's all you need to do. And he showed me the spot, it was a couple of wad lengths out and he said, just come here early as you can, throw maggots in all day, he said, and you'll catch nothing all day long. He says, but a couple of hours before you have to go home, because this was the other thing about this lake as well, you couldn't even night fish it. It, had, it closed at like whenever sundown was. It didn't even have like a consistent closing time. In the winter, you were lucky if you would be able to fish it till half four in the afternoon. So summertime, it was up until about eight o'clock at night. So just as the sun's starting to go down and the shadows go longer, that was when the fish come alive. And you would just, you know, catch, you'd have nothing all day long and then catch three or four carp in an hour, like before you had to go. And, and that was a big part of the adrenaline of carp fishing that venue. And not to mention the fact that it had some monsters in it. It really had chunks in it. Even to this day, I still haven't had a bream bigger than the, my PB out of there or tench bigger than the biggest tench I had out of there. And it, even though it didn't look like an old, you know, mature lake, the fish in there were old warriors. You could just tell by the, the size of them and the way that they looked. And it was, although on top of the surface, it didn't look magical, Underneath it was like a wonderland. It's a good start, Kaz. That's a koi, isn't it? Now, if it wasn't for that fish, I don't think that we would have continued and carried on it to this day doing this because after that months went past without me catching another carp. After a few weeks of fishing Bedfont Lakes, we could see that the actual place was starting to go downhill and it wasn't being maintained at all. And lo and behold, a few weeks into actually filming Re Real Men, the lake closed down to a fisherman and you weren't allowed to fish it anymore. So we then had to find another venue. But then I remember Again, back in the old days when I was a kid, that there was a place that I used to go and take my nephew Archie with me quite often. And I did a bit of research on Google and whatever and found out that it was Twine Ash Fishery and that the place was still going. So we went down there for an episode and lo and behold, we caught a few bream. Now, although bream can be looked at as a nuisance species when you're trying to catch carp, they were welcomed so much because we'd only been catching small roach and perch and like one pike for a whole year. So that, thank God, was a breath of fresh air for us. We did that episode, we edited it, we released it and whatever, didn't have any contact with the, the fishery manager or anything at that point. And then it got to a day where it was like, let's go down again but we won't take the cameras and that because it was starting to get really stressful and I was starting to really believe that the reason I weren't catching fish was because I was too busy trying to focus on trying to make a fishing program. So it was like, right, let's go down there, let's forget the cameras, we'll just go and do some fishing. And I went down on pit two and at the time it was pretty much packed and I got this one swim that was right round the corner by some trees and I remember sitting there and I watched every angler, it was there for 24 hours, and I watched every angler like clockwork from the first guy that was on the left hand side of me, caught a fish, then left hand side of him, fish, 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 and then by the time he got back to me, I had to go home. So it was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my God. So I thought, well surely, it was a bit more time and whatever, I'll be able to catch some fish. But while I was there, the actual fishery manager came up to me and he'd seen the video that we did on the bream 
and he was really impressed with what we did and everything else and we got talking and um, I said to him you know if, if you didn't mind that we use this place quite often then you know I'd like to try and get the, the, the 30 pound carp for me and we got a talk in and he was telling me about the membership and the membership was like 400 and something quid which was way out of our budget but there was a waiting list and he would be willing to put us at the top of the waiting list if this was something that we wanted to do so we coughed up the 480 quid which was painful as mate and um but it turned out to be one of the best things that we could do because obviously it gave us such a variety it gave us a whole year to be able to fish it whenever we wanted we had over we had eight lakes to pick from on this one venue and you know half the lakes had 30 pluses in it so we thought happy days here we go this is the venue and unfortunately it turned out that it wasn't going to be as easy as we first thought there's bigger fish in here and a larger quantity of bigger fish so even though it might take a little bit longer to get a bite, I'm feeling quite confident today that I am going to get a bite and hopefully that bite will be a bigger fish. So all we can do now is sit back and see what happens. Remember how it started I was lost in a dream When the fire in my heart said An open road I've already found sunlight The feeling grows And anything sounds alright I'm breaking loose Well, things are very quiet at the moment, so it's time for a brew. And it'd be nice if it was time for a fish. It's a tough one to call. This pit, for some reason, I'd never feel confident on this pit. But it's got some stonking fish in it, man. I've seen them. And I know exactly where they are, they're hiding over in the corner. A few people have pointed out a couple of spots. So I'm doing exactly what they said. It's always good to listen to the regulars, mate. Really is. Always good to listen to the regulars. They've all said about using nut flavoured baits, which is exactly what I'm using. So I've got white chocolate and coconut pop-ups as a hook bait. I've got a single on one with a stringer with tiger nut boilies and white chocolate and coconut boilies. Everything has been glugged in tiger nut glug, which has got a real nutty smell to it. And the other one I'm fishing um, a white chocolate and coconut pop-up with a tiger nut boilie as well with a PVA bag with um, a mixture of the two boilies. What I can do is just hope and pray for a fish. fishing is the anticipation of not knowing if you're going to catch anything not to mention the biggest fish that you're ever going to catch but it was getting to a point now where we were blanking just too many times and I remember thinking pit two 
is going to be the place where I'm going to catch a 30. And I remember going down there with Adam, my cousin again, he hadn't been in an episode for quite a while, but we had a pike in our swim. At the end of the day, a carp has been small at some point in its life and has avoided pike. We managed to knock that pike out, got it out of the way and thought, okay, maybe we're going to have a good chance now. But again, the same thing happened. The day grew on and grew on and nothing was happening. By now, Adam had to go home because he had work early in the morning and we were taking him home. And as we took him home, we went past pit one, which has always been packed. And this was the first time I'd ever seen it completely empty. So I rushed Adam home, went straight back down to pit one. And luckily enough, we got our second carp of the series. Get in there. So finally, I've been blanking for so long now. Here she is. It's the common carp, part of the king carp family. She's not a 30 pounder by any means, but my God, every little inch of this means so much right now worked so hard to try and bag a carp. I've literally blanked for almost a year. So, it might be a small package, but it means quite a lot, this fish. All we can say now, is just slipping back. Did you make it? Did you break free? Did you manage to be who you want to be? Maybe somewhere you think about me too Steady pressure. Hate this fighting under the rod tip. So nervous. Nice swell marks in the water though. Give up. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. This is hard work when you're used to fighting Bream. Let's 
easy, 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 easy. Oh, come on, net. We are in. Whew. That's a better looking fish. So coming on to last knockings now. This one is a little bit better. Still, I know we're after a 30, and this again is not a 30, but you can just about imagine how stunning a 30 pounder would look. This one's got to be close to double figures though, I'd say. Maybe eight, nine pound. Again, pristine condition. Stunning common carp from Twinosh Fishery. And all I can say is today, I have got a proper smile on my face. So glad I haven't blanked. And to bag two today, well, let's just say I'm a very happy chappy right now. So, let's get this guy back. Well. Okay, so we come down here again. We've dropped Adam off because he had to go to work. And due to the weather, we're not gonna have too much time really, but fingers crossed, as he says. Here we go. Yes. We haven't got too much time. This is a carp. I'm in trouble here, because my net isn't set up. Easy, easy, easy. Get that tight line. I'm going to need you to do this net. Well, I wasn't expecting that. And by the magic of television, the net is now together. And this is scrapping a good and under the rod tip. No, don't go under there. I can't let you go under there, buddy. Oi, 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 oi. Give it some line. I don't want it to go in them trees, though. Such scrappers. This feels a good fish. Come on, baby. Oh, I hate that when they roll over the line like that. More, mate, we're too close to them trees. Yes, nice fish. Let's have a look. So there she is, third one, and another stunning common carp from Twinosh Fishery. I'm literally about to pack up and go home. I was just doing the outro there, explaining that Adam had to go to work, and that we didn't have much time here. And another tear intake from yet another stunning common carp from Twinosh Fishery. We had a venue, we had 
a lake on the venue that we knew we would be able to at least catch something. It didn't have a 30 in it, but if things got real bad, we could always go back to that lake and fish it if we had another long section of time where we weren't catching nothing. And so we continued on pit two, but it still continued to punish us. And by this time, we'd started learning where the fish were going and knowing that you could turn up on pit two, poke your head round this tiny little corner and just see the fish sitting there. And no matter what you threw at them, it, they just weren't playing ball with me. So I was at this point starting to look at the other lakes on the venue and went back to the original lake that we first went to, which was pit number seven, where we had the bream from. And then it turned out that that lake was just so filled with bream. I remember one night in particular where I changed all my rigs completely. I'd gone over to using Ronnie rigs with massive baits and, um, and little did I know that I was about to experience something quite special. down on Twinos Fishery again on Bream City, hopefully gonna catch one of those elusive carp. So for now, let's see what we get today. So we're down here for two nights. This is the first night. We did get down here a little bit late, but I mean, now the light is really sort of hanging around a bit longer. It's not getting proper dark to about half eight, nine o'clock, which is very handy indeed. I have just had some sort of a disturbance on my right hand rod. It could have been a liner, but I'm thinking it's more likely that something has picked it up and spat it out. Because I'm using backleads, geese are really sort of coming up close on the swim. And I don't really want them keep getting sort of tangled up in the line and whatnot. So the right hand rod has had something interested in it. So what I've done is I did go over there earlier around the area and bait it up with a couple of handfuls of boilies. And now I've recatapulted a few more out there because if there's something there, the possibility is that it's eating everything that I put down there earlier. And although I don't really want to overfeed the fish, if there's some sort of activity down there, you don't want to run the risk that it's gone around and picked off everything that you threw out there earlier, especially when night time's drawing in, because I want to know that when I do sort of get down in the bed chair and whatever, I know that everything and all my traps are set and they're all as good as they possibly can be. 
I've got the right hand rod over to the trees over the far bank on the right hand side here. I've got my left hand rod over on to, under just sort of, there's a little cove there. I literally cast out so it went onto the bank over the other side. I picked the lead up, put my hook link on and literally threw it down there into this little sort of cove and then threw a couple of handfuls of bait down there as well. And I am using a third rod literally just for the bream. So hopefully by the end of the night, we should at least get something. So fingers crossed. o'clock. I expected anything less It's an old slimer. I am a little bit surprised that it's actually took a bait in such bright sunshine, but there's so many of them in here. I'm not really that surprised, I guess. He's not as big as the ones we've had before, but he's a blank saver. Let's hope that by tonight, this turns into a big, fat, juicy carp. Let's slip him back. Okay, so light is definitely dying down now. Probably got maybe half an hour left before it gets proper dark, which is around about the same sort of time yesterday that things were really starting to pick up. Um, a lot colder though tonight already. We've got a clear sky and um, temperature has really dropped. So I'm hoping that's not gonna affect the fishing too much because this is a very deep lake and the temperature in the lake would take quite a long time really before that temperature will change so hopefully it's going to be a similar story to last night because like i said earlier i had so many runs but i just couldn't hit into them so this time i'm much more prepared to smash into those runs if and hopefully when they occur so fingers crossed by the end of the night we're going to have at least something on the bank Three o'clock in the morning. And look what we got here. It's still not a carp from pit number seven. And yet another snot bag. I'm using the biggest boilies I've got. 
This guy has been sitting on there for literally about 15 minutes. I got woken up with a trickle of beeps and then it went quiet and then about 10 minutes later there's one more beep and I thought oh, I better check that wad. And this is what we got sitting on the end of it. A sleep disturber. Anyhow, let's slip this guy back and hope that the next little trickle of beeps is a 30 pound carp. Absolute monster. Nailed him. Well, I thought going on the luck that I had on this first night that today was going to be an absolute disaster. But my God, look at what persistence has brought us here. Oh! This is a new PB for me. It's 27 pound of Twinerge Mirror Carp. So in a way, we'd done it. My previous PB Carp was 26 pound and we'd beaten it just slightly, you know. But we still, even though the challenge was kind of done because we'd got the biggest fish that I'd ever seen. We'd gone that couple of pound extra and called it a hunt for a 30 pound carp. And little did we know that a bit of a disaster was about to happen. And we went down into the garage to pack the gear up and head back down to pit seven after we had had that PB got to the garage and the locks were off and opened the garage door and my wads were gone. Who would have thought that after everything that had happened, you know, Bedfront Lakes being closed down, the wads getting nicked and whatever, that the second you get back on your feet and you've got them wads out there, that you achieved what you set out to do over a year ago. Right. So I'm back down here on pit number seven. And as you remember, I had that glorious 27 pound mirror cart from here. So I've literally set up all three rods around the same similar area that I caught that 27 pounder on. But later on, I'm gonna get one and downscale it a little bit and hit the bream because after all, we're on the infamous bream city and I would really love to christen the rods. So till then, let's see what we get today.
Okay, so I said earlier that I was going to downsize the rigs just for the bream, and that's exactly what I've done. A size 10 hook, literally with a knotless knot, and then three grains of fake corn, and I'm just fishing that over a bed of corn, and I mean the bream get suckered into this every single time. So let's whack it back out there and get a bit more slimy. Typical bream again, does nothing when it's on the rod and then gives you a good kick in when it's out of the water. This is why I've been unhooking them in the lake, but this one seemed to be a bit more substantial, hence why I thought I'd give them a bit of a closer look. Look at the snot on it, it's absolutely disgusting. But it's let me test the new rods out and I like them. They're quite sensitive. I'd love to know what a carp feels like, but at least I felt a little bit of weight with this guy. Let's get this limey old sod back where he belongs. Little Terry the Tench. A new one for real men. This is a weird coloured tench though. I mean, normally you get the dark emerald greens and, and the golden colours. This almost looks like a cross between the two. It's very golden in colour on the bottom, but a stunning little fish. Tench are definitely one of my favourites. So um, I'm quite happy with this little guy.
is not the biggest one, obviously, but he's still got a little bit of weight to him. And it's nice to have had a bream, a tench, and now a carp as well. And like I said in the last episode, I do like a mirror no matter what size they are. So, very chuffed with this guy. I think it's time we slip him back and maybe see if we can get a little bit bigger. Okay, so that was a nice little carp to end on the night. Obviously, I'm not going home yet. I'm going to be spending the night here. So I've reset all my traps now. I've literally got my right hand rod still on them 20 mils, which is what I had that carp on. He ended up being 12 pounds, so that's not a bad size. A nice little double figure fish there. And the middle rod is where I had that tench on. I've dropped the size down on that to a 15 mil boilie, and my left hand rod is still out there for the bream, fishing over a bed of corn with the three fake corn nuggets there on there as well. So hopefully the night time should be quite eventful, but we have had a lot of mixing, changing weather today. It's been windy, it's been rainy, we've had cold spells, warm spells, but the fish really seem to be turned on by it because there's a low pressure. So fingers crossed tonight will be even more eventful. Let's see if we can get that 30 pound carp. Is the mic working, yeah? I don't believe that. It's the biggest fish I've ever seen. And it could still be the biggest fish we've ever seen. Let's have a look at it. This is a new PB again for me. 33 pounds of Twinos Common Carp. This fish is otherwise known, I believe, as floppy tail. 33 pounds. We finally did it, guys. The hunt for 30 is over. As long as it took to get that fish, the moment I held it and weighed it and saw that it was over 30 pound, <clears throat> you'll see in the video that I almost look a bit disappointed. The main reason, without a doubt, for feeling almost disappointed about catching that fish was because it felt like we was then gonna have to say goodbye to everybody that watches. It's just the quality of the people that watch our videos is amazing. That's something that I don't want to just throw away. So just remember guys, I appreciate you. Tight lines, heavy nets, and I... We'll see you later. Is that it? Thank God. I can't stand doing these videos for these people, my God. Get this mic off me, I can't breathe. Mission complete. I've nicked one from pit number two. 
And this has got to probably be the smallest fish in the whole lake. But never mind. It took fishing on the surface to nick him and losing five other fish in the process of trying to get this one in the net. But it's finally done. Let's stick him back. Thank you.